Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Legion Patreon episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. I am one third of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to climax, and if you can please get me wet and feed me after midnight. (laughs) And with Scott (laughs) is Heather Powell coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. But more importantly, as with all these top five episodes, we have a very special guest with us. Um, This gentleman has, I think, is a pioneer in the podcasting community. He he is is. a strong voice on Fresh Cuts. He is also on No More Room in Hell. He's also on Theme Warriors. And I believe, I can't remember the one that he does for the Freddy's Nightmare series, Um, but I'll get him to, you know. Burning for Springwood. Oh, Burning for Springwood. Right, Burning for Springwood. Um, he is probably one of the most intelligent, kind, welcoming podcasters that I've had a privilege of, of working with. Uh, back when I first got into podcasting, he added me right away to the Fresh Cuts chat group, which is extremely popular among our podcasting friends. Uh, he's he's really funny and he rolls with jokes really well. And he is Mr. Mike Merriman. Mike, thank you for joining us. Hey, what's up? Yeah, I don't know what was better, like that intro of me or Scott's like ever increasingly long uh, <laughs> <laughs> intro of himself. Like I, those two intros are battling each other. <laughs> right? Like, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm Heather. I'm from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. Like there's nothing fucking special. Um, so Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, with all of our special guests, we always ask for a little bit of background of how they got into liking horror movies and then how they got into podcasting. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about you. All right. So I guess we'll start with the how I got into horror period um i well i uh, i'll start off by saying i was kind of fortunate to live in a household that was pretty open to content consumption in all forms obviously you know it's not everything goes but for my age i remember just kind of being allowed to watch whatever i had a tv in my bedroom from a young age now obviously I feel so old now. When I was a kid, it's not like you had 100 channels to choose from. It was like your five local networks. But um, one of my earliest memories was my dad taking me to the drive-in. We were big drive-in family back then. And um, Batman 89 was playing with Child's Play. And I think he half expected that, uh, you know, being like uh, eight, about eight or nine at the time, he probably have expected me to fall asleep somewhere during Batman and sleep through child's play. But uh, what happened was the the beginning part of that plan worked, except I woke up not realizing we were into child's play and suddenly a babysitter (laughs) gets thrown out the the skyscraper window. So I was like, huh, what is it? And I found out shortly after, no longer Batman on the screen. Batman Um, through the babysitter. (laughs) Yeah, and I think it was that, and he showed me like a scene from Dream Warriors because it just happened to be on TV at the time. And it was one of those things where being a kid, you were definitely scared, but it also kind of gave you that excitement and the anxiety that ever since I've been chasing when I watch horror movies, you know? So... It was just, it was bored out pretty quick just from watching movies as a kid and, and like I said I think it helped being uh, raised in a family that was pretty open to it like I'm not you were watching Solo and Serbian so, film uh, yeah. at a young age <laughs> yeah that, that's what I did like you my watched Serbian uh, film senior project on yeah that's Solo <laughs> Solo was your senior project right. Yeah, I, I feel bad for all of the, the, like, you hear a lot from podcasters, like, oh, I wasn't even allowed to watch horror movies until I was 16, or so. I was like, oh, man, that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I was young when I started watching them, just like you. Mm-hmm. I, I think I remember, too, my parents watching uh, Tales from the Crypt when it was on HBO, mm-hmm. like, originally yep. airing, and I would kind of, like, watch but not watch, you know, kind of over their shoulders, or I'd be in the kitchen quote unquote getting some food and just kind of standing there watching the tv screen and fascinated by that at the time because i was too young to even really know about the ec comics and uh yeah so those kind of things started me out on the journey and then as far as podcasting itself goes 
we're looking i think officially my first show was 2008 and it was called evil episodes podcast uh went through a different a few different versions with co-hosts but basically it was to do horror tv that was the focus on it and um the reason i was interested in that at the time was a because when i kind of grew up in the mid late early 90s or excuse me mid late 80s into early 90s there was kind of like a horror tv renaissance at that time as a kid with like tales from the dark side monsters tales from the crypt um and all the other like you know lower budget shows so you know then it kind of went away for a while not 100 percent, but then in the late 2000s you know you had dexter uh walking dead was just getting started um and american horror story was just getting started so i i was hearing all uh more horror podcasts at the time that just weren't even covering the shows uh other than in passing like acknowledging that they're out there but not really getting into it so I was like, hey, maybe this would be a good idea to cover. And that went for six years, maybe about wow. 140 episodes. Wow. And what what kind of brought that show to the end was just me eventually, you know, I, with kids, it was hard to keep up on TV yeah. shows. And once you get behind, when you're covering multiple TV shows, once you get behind and it's like, oh, I need to watch like three episodes of five shows. It's like, couldn't keep up. And to me, that type of show, specifically when you're covering TV, it's just not as topical unless you're on top of it every week. Right. Um, and you were too busy watching other shows with your kids. Oh, yeah, Dora, or whatever that Peppa shit Peppa Pig. Like. Oh, Peppa <laughs> Pig, which has its own horror theme apparently on the internet. But yeah, not, yeah, not the show yeah. that you needed to be watching. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, that's kind of the history for me. And uh, it when that went away, I was like, well, I don't want to stop podcasting totally. So started up like No More Woman Hell, where it was more we just pick what we want to watch and do all that kind of stuff so that's where we are today well where did fresh cuts come from like how did you come up with that so fresh cuts and i don't know how much you guys might already i forget who knows what so fresh cuts was kind of a, an evolution from uh something on evil so evil episodes because it was mostly tv horror and stuff well we would try to incorporate uh when we would watch new movies on it but it just was a weird kind of fit because like you can mm. do its own separate segment. So I created like a sidecast called Just the Movies because it was like- Oh, well, I've heard of that. Right, yeah. exactly. So then somewhere in the life of Just the Movies, I brought Venom on um, as like the co-host of that. But then when we stopped Evil Episodes, I was kind of talking to him on the side and it was like, it didn't make sense to call it Just the Movies anymore because it's like, well, if this is Just the Movies and what else, like, you know, there's no, no companion to it. Yeah. So then we changed it to Fresh Cuts and which made more sense given the context of everything going on. And then it paired with No More in Hell, it made sense. So that's where Fresh Cuts came from. Um, and it's it's been like pretty consistent. Like, I think we i think we take off like a week or two at the end of the year when we're trying to put together the top 10 list because that's when we're doing all our catch-up watches of what did we miss from this year but other than that it's pretty much every week which i'm actually pretty i'm pretty like impressed with like when i go to look at the because i save all the a copy of all the files and when i go to the folder to see i was like wow we really did do this every single week this year well, I got to tell you, Mike, when I first started listening to horror podcasts, so I first found Kill the Cast and then I found Fresh mm -hmm. Cuts and I was like, oh my God, Venom and Mike are so cool. They know so much. Like I, I was religious with those downloads. The moment you dropped a new episode, I was listening to it. And then when you added me to the Fresh Cuts chat, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say Chad is Mike and Venom. Oh my God, they're so cool. Oh my God, I'm such a loser. Like and The funny thing is, uh, sorry, Heather, to interrupt, but- uh, No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, the funny thing is, because uh, you and I were just starting to talk about our podcast at that point. And- uh, Oh, I was listening to Fresh Cuts a year before I met Well, no, you. no, I'm just saying when you got added to the chat. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then I was like, oh, I didn't get added to the chat. What oh, the yeah, hell? Right. And then, <laughs> then you ended up and added me a little bit later, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, of course, Scott he didn't realize that he wasn't as cool as me um still doesn't that's why we have a fucking eight hour intro that he needs to do i got but, uh, self-esteem boost 
<laughs> but honestly, Mike, you've always been so welcoming from the beginning. I feel like in our little podcasting, a former horophilia, now um, dark discussion slash legion, like you're the welcoming guy. You're the yeah. guy where you go to a party who goes, hey, you want a drink? Hey, you want a toke? Like you're that guy. You're that guy that shows everyone where to put their jacket and introduce <laughs> them to people because you were just so welcoming. And I hope you never change that about yourself, especially for new podcasters. And you always give people a chance on Fresh Cuts. Um, that's where I cut my teeth, you know, going on mm-hmm. fresh t- cuts and some uh, commentaries that I've done with Nudie on NFW and it's not horror. And of course, going on with Killed the Cast. If it wasn't for that experience, I probably wouldn't have had any confidence to start my own. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, that's what, what my vision. So originally when it was just me and Venom, it was kind of my vision, like, you know, just uh, me and Venom will co-host and we'll just bring on different people every week, whether it's like new people I meet or people I've known forever, especially you know, the pandemic kind of messed with everything because we had to obviously go to VOD stuff where not everyone might have seen what we watched. But the first few years when it was like pretty much theatrical stuff all the time, I, I just felt it was a good outlet to get different people on because these are the movies most people are going to see, period, like mm-hmm. across the board. Regardless of like everyone's personal taste in movies, most horror fans want to go to the theater to see whatever is new and then give right. it a chance. So I was like, okay, here's a good opportunity to get people on. Like, it's a movie everyone's going to see. I'm not asking anyone to track down something crazy. And everyone knows when movies come out. They're, it's almost like you don't need an expert. It's like, hey, the movie comes out here. We're recording here. If you can make it cool. If not, we'll get you next time. Like, all easy and smooth. Well, even for your top 10 shows too. Like, if someone doesn't know, like, doesn't have their own show or for some reason they just want to do a top 10, they know they can go on Fresh Cuts. And I think that's mm-hmm. a really, it, it speaks to who you are as a person. So, you know, I think it's awesome that you can join us and awesome for everything that you've done for the community. I'm like, Heather, if you're trying to get on this year's top 10 show, just ask. Oh my God. <laughs> we do awards and I don't, Scott and I always think that's a good idea. We're always like, well, we've done our one award show. Like, let's fucking hold our shit here, right? But like- <laughs> You know, we're always like, yeah, yeah, we'll do we'll do awards because I like other people's top 10, but I find that sometimes the top 10s are repetitive. And mm-hmm. when you go on a top 10 show with too many people, everyone's just saying the same movie over and over again and then trying to say something different about the movie. Um, so I prefer listening than I do going on. Uh, but I appreciate the invite. I know that I could get on any time, Mike. Like, let's be real. You and oh, I look, are VIP. Look at her ego. Well, you know, I'm kind of important. I'm, the, I'm, I'm in a couple a of chat groups with Mike now. and it's, it's, It sounds like we have some student has become the master type. That's thing. right. That is exactly what has happened. I run this community for sure. <laughs> yeah. All, all things considered, I'm thinking like, this year could be interesting with top tens only because of so much VOD. Like we yes. did, yeah. we we did start getting obviously the theaters open again, but I still think there's a lot out there that, that wasn't in theaters. And like so many people I'm seeing talk about movies I haven't even seen, and I just start adding it to this never ending list of things I need to see. Same. Your watch year. list, your watch list that mm-hmm. ends up being like fifty fucking movies, and then you're like, oh fuck my life. Okay, what looks interesting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, right. that used to just happen on Netflix, but now it's like every app. I'm like, oh, I got 20 on this app. I need to watch 10 over here, five. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so true. Hashtag, hashtag horror now, which is the way we want it to be. Thank God we have access to more international films. Thank God Shutter has great access. Netflix for international films. Prime even sometimes you can get some good shit on Prime. You know, thank God we have it. Thank God we have the variety. But uh, thanks for being here, Mike. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Scotty and Scotty can introduce our our topic for this top five, I think we've already said it, but not Scotty can say it again and uh, we'll get started. All right. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for joining us, Mike. Cause yeah, you have, like Heather said, you are super welcoming. You are the welcome committee when it comes to podcasting and yeah, you have always been just like, so offering and uh, offered me to join your show multiple times. I think I, and I did the top 10 of you guys last year, which was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so we will get into our top five list and our top five list is basically our top five Halloween watches. This is our own personal choice on like movies that we have a tradition with watching around this time of year. Um, so each week it could be, you know, exactly Halloween themed or it couldn't, it's just whatever we feel. It could be Halloween one to five. Yeah. Or it (laughs) could just be like movies not related to Halloween at all. Yes. (laughs) We don't give a shit. There's no rules here on Friday Nightmare. We run our own rules. Yeah, we we run Barter Town. That's right. That, that's, as uh, as course, Psyops would say. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. So I will get to uh, our number five. So my number five is a childhood favorite that I grew up pretty much throughout the age of like seven and up. Still watch the hell out of his movies. And I have to go with 1991's Ernest Scared Stupid. I knew it was coming. I fucking love this movie to death. It is. I've, I'm uh, for one to all the listeners. I am a huge Ernest fan. I own all of his movies. I watch them pretty regularly. Probably at least once a year. I'll go through like the entire Ernest series. And Ernest Scared Stupid is always uh, one of my first go-to Halloween themed watches because I just love the special makeup effects for the trolls done by the Chiodo brothers who have done like critters and uh, killer clowns from outer space. And plus, it's just earnest, so it's just corny and silly and fun. And it's just a great film to introduce to, like, someone that's not a big fan of horror, but has elements of horror. Because there are certain scenes in this movie that are pretty damn creepy, especially with the troll when he gets, like, his full powers, like, during the last third of the movie. Like, it's, yeah, I just love this film and will talk about it nonstop all the time. I and I have to say, uh, Cut to the Chase is actually going to be doing an episode on it. And I was so bummed my name did not get pulled for the Ernest Scared Stupid movie. <laughs> it did get pulled for Beetlejuice, so I did, which was also a great movie for me to get picked because I love that movie as well. I remember seeing Ernest Scared Stupid, I think, on the Family Channel oh, back yep. in the day. And I think I liked it, but I think it was 1991, 1992. Like we're going back in oh, time. It's definitely, uh, it is definitely a p- uh, piece of 1991 for sure. <laughs> right. And I think I dug it. I don't, I haven't watched it again because it's not, Scott knows I probably wouldn't be my type of movie now, but maybe I should give it a shot because I find when I watch my childhood movies, I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Like yeah, it like totally sure, ruins it for me. I'm sure you would roll your eyes heavily with a lot of the Ernest stuff, but I think you would love the practical effects in it. Nice. How about you, Mike? Have you seen Ernest Scared Stupid? Oh yeah, I saw it when I I might have seen it in the theater. I, mean, I was pretty young, but uh, yeah, I think it actually does a decent job at trying to be scary in parts. Because I mean, the, I, I believe the troll is like turning kids into like pieces of wood or something. Yep. Like. Yeah, and uh, it's definitely Ernest being Ernest. Like, it's, it's kind of like if you are a fan of Ernest, I feel like you're going to like most Ernest movies. Because I remember Ernest Goes to Camp and Ernest Goes to Jail. I was a big fan of. I think yep. there was one where he saved Christmas, too. Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, so it, it's like, okay, what else are we going to do? Do a Halloween movie. Um, and, and, yeah, the trolls... I found out recently they were actually the Killer Clowns costumes repainted to be yeah. Different, so. Yes, certain ones were yeah repurposed uh, Killer Clowns, which was awesome because you can yeah. And when see- you when you see the side by side online, it it totally like it's not even hard to see, you know. Yeah, I'll say because you can pick them out easily. Like when you see them, and you're like, once you know that and you see them mm-hmm. on screen, you're going, oh shit, yeah, that's that clown. Okay. <laughs> now, just to be clear, we are giving spoilers, everyone. So I know we just spoiled 1991's Ernest Scared Stupid, <laughs> but just so you know, if we say a movie that was maybe recent, we will be giving away things that could spoil that movie. So listener discretion is advised. Mike, <laughs> what's your number five? All right. So my number five, I actually got clarification on this just to make sure. Um, but you guys, uh, I the judges conferred and they said it is allowed. <laughs> so I actually had something originally written down, but I'm going to kind of expand it because I think it goes beyond just this specific show or series. Um, I had originally written down Trials of Horror because if we're talking about oh, yeah! actual, yeah, if we're talking about nice. actual Halloween traditions, you know, growing up, um, for those in my general age group, they might remember that Trials of Horror for a certain amount of years actually did air on Halloween itself. So yeah, I remember oh, yeah. that. There, yeah, yeah. There's there are some years without how we would do it. We would go trick or treating, rush back to watch the episode, yep. and then go back out. Um, and those first like what six, seven, eight years of Trials of Horror, the parodies, the writing, the satire was so spot on. And the horror movies they were spoofing were usually very easily recognizable. I love the fact that um, they weren't canon for the normal series, so they could pretty much do anything they want with no repercussions for the regular series itself. Now, what I'm saying about expanding out, I'm actually going to expand it to just TV Halloween specials in general, like whether it's like Roseanne, Garfield. Yes. Nice. There was something special about seeing all these shows just get into the spirit. Now, the funny thing is I think Roseanne still 
Dude, I think their Halloween episodes still did feature canon for the regular series. Like they would, it did. It, yeah, they would acknowledge the holidays going on, but there were still like story arcs that would carry over and just write through, which is fine. I mean, being able to manage to do that is a feat in itself. Yeah. But um, yeah, something about when we're talking growing up, the ho- the actual holiday itself, there's something cool about just seeing like shows across the board just put on their costumes and get into the spirit. So yeah, that's my yep. number five. That's awesome. awesome. I have to say, and uh, that was that was not a purposeful throwback to my old podcast friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, like especially Roseanne, because that series when they got into Halloween, they got into Halloween. Like they did the yeah. whole haunted house thing. Roseanne as the character just loved Halloween. The whole family loved Halloween so you got to see some really awesome outfits like their halloween episodes are some of my favorites to revisit i just mm-hmm. love them. they fully embraced it yes and the treehouse horror a lot of those didn't have happy endings and no. i was you know i was a kid that was very nervous i think you know i've talked about that before in this podcast i did not get into horror until i was older not because my parents kept me from it because i was fucking terrified of a vampire commercial <laughs> on tv like I was just scared of everything. And the treehouse horror was something I could, I could digest because it was a cartoon, you know, and I knew it was the Simpsons and it was okay. And I still remember the quote, the Raven um, oh, yep. one very clearly. And I think that it really does have its place in pop culture history. And I'm really glad you brought it to the table, Mike. Cool. So, yeah, well, man. <laughs> have your daughters watched it? Uh, they will watch. Like I have the craziest thing with my kids. It's, my kids are impossible to try to get them to watch stuff but if mm. i just throw if i just throw it on like i'm watching it and they're in the room i always catch them like watching the stuff on the tv obviously you know it's just a natural thing so i've almost given up on being like come on let's watch this and i'm just putting it on and, and they'll eventually start watching it. that's you know what sometimes that's what you got to do you just got to trick people into shit that's how i get most of my relationships um <laughs> I, I, yeah i, I think it's it just <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think part of it is just so much content at their fingertips at this age, as opposed to when we were kids that there's so much stuff like they're already into themselves that it's like trying to break them from that stuff. It's, it's hard. Like, so I'm just like, I'm just good old Simpsons kids. This show's been on for 40 years almost. Yeah. Back in, my day, back in my day, our kids programming was on the TV. That's right. Parts yeah, that that Pray Simpsons. <laughs> um, so my number five is a very, uh, it's an indie low budget movie, but it's a fun fucking movie. And it's called The Fun House Massacre from 2015. Nice. Uh, for the synopsis for people who haven't seen it, is six of the world's scariest psychopaths escape from a local asylum and proceed to unleash terror on an unsuspecting crowd of Halloween at a uh, unsuspecting crowd at a Halloween fun house. So the mazes all represent, there's six mazes, I believe, and each maze represents one of the killers. So there's like a meat cutting one, there's like a teacher one. And I love this movie. I love movies based at haunts because I love going to haunts. It's my jam. And Robert Englund is in this movie. He's not in it for long. I do always love how he just shows up randomly for some cameos here and there. But this movie is fucking fun. Uh, some of the kills are great. The ending, how you think it's going to end and it, <laughs> you think this one dude's going to survive and he doesn't. It's just awesome. It is fun. There's one part that's my favorite is these two radio show hosts are there promoing the event. And then one of the killers comes and kills the one radio show host and the radio show host keeps going because he thinks it's part of the gag. And then yep. he ends up getting fucking killed. It, the comedy in this is bang on. It's a simple watch. If you haven't watched it yet and you enjoyed things like um, other movies based at haunts, then I totally recommend it. It's a 2015 Funhouse Massacre. Have either one of you two seen it? Yes, I actually uh, seen it for the first time uh, doing it for uh, NFW with you and Nudie and all that. That's right. That was, yeah. that, that was a lot of fun. That was my pick. I forgot that you were on that episode. What yep. about you, Mike? I haven't, but because I'm on camera, you can see I am writing it down with this pen because oh you'll watch <laughs> nice. it it's worth it like well, it's funny well one of the cool thing about list shows is like anything someone lists off and are enthusiastic about add it to my list so yeah i'm gonna check it out like yeah. from listening to you i think you'll like it it's a fun good gory fun little ride it's it's easy to sit through yeah it's cool. a it's very entertaining nice all, all right, right. Scotty. so my number four 
Well, it's from uh, this one I actually got into probably about 10 years ago, did not know it existed for the longest time. And then the DVD became out of print. And thankfully, I had bought it not knowing that it was out of print, bought it for like five bucks. And it's from 1986. And before I even say the name of the movie, I just have to say, long live Sammy Kerr. So my pick is 1986 Trick or Treat. Nice. Uh, If you love uh, 80s metal and supernatural horror and Ozzy Osbourne and Gene Simmons, then this movie is right up your alley. (laughs) It is totally 80s. Uh, has some great music by a band called Fastway, and I believe that is one of the reasons why it's out of print is because the copyright issues with Fastway's music in it is uh, they lost the rights, so they were not able to do it. And I think you can find like a import in Germany or something like that, Blu-ray. But yeah, this is one mo- one movie I hope to God sees the light of day and gets a U.S. release again because the DVD is by the cover. It shows Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne in it, who are only in it for maybe like. 30 seconds to a minute and they are the main faces on the cover so it's like if you see you're gonna be like oh this looks dumb but yeah it is such a good time the special practical effects are a blast the music is awesome the characters in it are fun and quirky got yourself like i totally related i can't remember the character's name off the top of my head but the main kid i totally related him with him because he was like the 80s metal nerd that uh was idolizing sammy kerr before sammy kerr ended up uh pretty much committing suicide but you find out later that 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 was part of his plan to come back as like this supernatural demon to basically uh uh cause hell and it's such a fun movie but i could totally relate with the character because yeah he just was always getting picked on for being the oddball that loved the 80s music and stuff like that and this is just one hell of a ride and one of these days heather i want i want to get your opinion on i it, still haven't watched it i know scotty it's bad i promise to watch it before halloween night this year okay i want to get your opinion on this yeah. see what you think <laughs> mike have you seen this yeah this one has a little mix of like all the 80s goodness you could want uh rock and roll and horror that kind of are a natural companion <laughs> to begin with yeah. uh i remember large marge is in this one. <laughs> oh, that's right, she is. yeah yeah uh yeah, and it's funny. It, it kind of has your like typical uh, thing where sometimes like there's these like rock legends build in the movie, and you're like, oh, you're so excited to see them, and like they show up for like a scene <laughs> yeah. or two. Okay, that's that. I guess that's better than nothing. But yeah, it's it's a totally fun movie, and it's the one that's often not talked about because of the more modern trick or treat. Exactly. So. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Mike, what would your number four be? All right. My number four, this is a movie that, man, I've been watching since I was way too young to see it. It involves, you know, a group of high schoolers that go to a Halloween party at a possessed or demon possessed house. It has a little bit of everything you would want. Halloween party costumes, the sleaze factor, uh, pretty good gory kills. A cool animated opening credits sequence that uh, not enough people talk about. The score is good, and uh, it just kind of has everything you would want as like a new horror fan trying to consume stuff. And because it actually involves, you know, uh, the party on the night of Halloween, you can't really go wrong with this one, in my opinion. And that would be Night of the Demons. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. This it's. It's one it's one of those movies I think for a while it wasn't being talked about anymore, but it's kind of made its way back into, you know, the minds of a lot of horror friends. And I I, I just think it it encapsulates everything about kind of those high school years and wanting to like go to the spooky Halloween party or you know, here's this old abandoned house. Uh let's just be brave and go throw a party in there. And of course, hijinks and scary stuff ensues. And then I like the kind of little side plot going on with the uh the angry neighbors that yes. he gets his it feels like so random like that almost feels like it would be like a wraparound in a, in a different type of movie yes right? it looks like an anthology <laughs> it, wraparound it, for sure yeah and it gets a payoff at the end anyway so i was like oh that's pretty cool to do so yeah night of the demons man one of my all-time faves i fucking great fucking movie love, man yeah i fucking love that movie and 
one of the best uh, uses of a Baja song when they're uh, <laughs> with Angela dancing with that crazy ass strobe. I love that yes. scene so much. And talk yeah. about like your random high schooler fucking drinking Halloween party in the middle of nowhere. Like it is, yeah, it it encompasses Halloween for sure. That's awesome, Mike. Yeah, because it it, it definitely feels like they like any real life group of friends. It starts out innocent enough. Oh, let's just go throw a party in the spooky house and. Uh, the way it just kind of devolves into what it is or what it does, it it's really cool. That's awesome. And, and I just and I always use this line, but eat a bag of fucks. I'm here to party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you use that line all the time. You love I that do. line. I fucking actually. love that line. <laughs> it's your jam. <laughs> Um, well, my my fourth is probably gonna be mixed for a lot of people, but I fucking love this movie movie when it came out, and that's Health Us 2018. Nice. Um, and I understand that it's a very you know basic paint by numbers plot here. We're looking at three young ladies who go with three gentlemen, one girl who's reconnecting with a high school crush, and they go to the theme park. But for anyone who's ever been to something like Universal Studios or Canada's Wonderland up here. Um, this is exactly what it's like going to this shit at a big theme park. You go through, there's tons of people there. The, there's these haunts that are, that are done. There's random people like Tony Todd doing performances in the street. Like I remember watching shit like that at Canada's Wonderland when I went a couple of years ago. And I love the idea of a killer being there and no one believes the main protagonist there's one point where she comes out of the washroom and she says to a security guard like he's here there's someone trying to kill me it's like everyone's trying to kill you it's halloween what the fuck are you talking about basically like that's the point of this park is to scare you and i just thought it was really clever one of the scenes that really sticks out to me is when she's stuck in the cart they're going to the extra scary area and the figure the killer's walking towards her and she's trying to get out and she can't i thought that was excellent um, same with the head chopping scene. Thought that was excellent. I, I know that there's some people that don't love this film, but as you can see, I love haunts. And I thought this film captured the paranoia, paranoia of what could happen at a haunt perfectly. Any thoughts? What yeah, do you guys I, think? I went to theaters to see this one. And I got to say right now, it is such, it was such a missed fucking opportunity for this movie because they put it out in November in theaters like why didn't that you do this in october this would have been perfect yeah for that's october. weird that they didn't do that in october i didn't realize because i watched it on on video vod oh okay watch it because yeah, i because so. yeah, i remember it was uh yeah in, in november and i went by myself to see it because like i do with a lot of matinees and mm -hmm. i just had a fucking blast with this film it is just like you said it's paint by numbers but it's just so fun and i love that setting of like the because it does remind me of like what universal studios does for their halloween horror nights I've never been there and I've always wanted to go and just seeing that on the screen. I thought that was like, that is a perfect setup for a horror film. And yeah. it's just like, I enjoyed the hell out of this movie a lot. And I know it gets kind of panned a little bit here and there, but I don't get it. Cause I love it. It was made for the masses. Right. Yeah. And, but it's made for people who have gone to, you know, up here, Canada's Wonderland is the biggest theme park in Canada. It's located in Toronto, which is about 45 minutes from me. Like it fucking captured that that atmosphere and makes you go, what if? Yeah. What if someone did come in there and have malicious intentions? They could probably get away with a couple of murders, to be quite fucking honest with you, before someone would catch it. Oh, absolutely. But there's just that many people there, right? What do you think, Mike? Any thoughts? Yeah, I've always personally loved like uh, theme parks, carnivals, sideshows, uh, all that kind of stuff. It makes for a great horror setting because I think there's like a natural anxiety when you're younger, just being immersed in that setting because there's so much stuff going on there's so many different mixes of everything that just that alone could get you paranoid and uh in trouble yourself yeah this movie um when it came out yeah i remember it was being very kind of polarizing between people who loved it and people who just thought it fell flat but i think it works i think it works um as a movie and i like you know it's kind of the gags they do in it and I'm just like, you can't not be scared at a theme park. Right. It's, <laughs> right, a fun, right? it's a fun, fluffy movie made for the masses, but I have a good time with it. So I'm glad <laughs> you guys have a good time with it too. So we'll move on to Scotty's number three. All right. So my number three, we're going a little bit further back in time to watch one of my favorite black and white horror classics. And that is a uh, 1959's William Castle's uh, 
House on Haunted Hill with what? good old Vincent Price. And just because I'm on camera, I'm can show. I'm wearing my House on Haunted Hill shirt with a cat in front of me. But <laughs> I can love this movie. Vin everyone knows that by now that Vincent Price is the fucking man. I love him to death. I love everything about him. And this is my first introduction to him. We'll see in this film at a very young age. And since then, it has become a Halloween tradition that I always watch it around the middle of October just to get myself hyped for the time of year it is. And I mean, what more to say besides this is like a just fun, like not even real haunted house movie because it's just all like just set up to scare people. But the acting in it and the toxic relationship that Vincent Price has with his wife of talking about how he tried to poison oh, her man. last year and this and that. And it's just so quirky and just like tongue in cheek, but just so much fucking fun. And I'll say, and I, um, have you guys both seen this? Yeah, I just watched it first time watch this year and much respect for this film. Wasn't what I thought it was going to be because I saw the remake first. Yes. Um, so that's, you know, but I know Mike's like bad Heather, but <laughs> I really did enjoy the 1959 and I'm so glad you brought that to your, to our list. Well, thank you. Yeah, so how about you, Mike? Yeah, I was waiting for Scott to say the 1991 one, and I was like, oh man, what am I going to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as the original, yes, it's amazing. I actually am a huge fan of William Castle, period. I, a lot of people refer to him as kind of like the B-movie version of Hitchcock because in a handful of his movies, he really tries to do like the same, not the same, but just a similar nature in twists um a lot of psychological stuff it just comes off more you know a little more cheesy because just William Castle movies are a lot smaller in scope than the huge um ideas that Hitchcock is putting in his films but I want to say William Castle stuff just works for me man and I totally can see why uh, House on Haunted Hill would be something for Halloween it, it just feels like that you know the spooky fun uh, content that you would want on a holiday if you're putting together like a marathon of movies on Halloween House on Haunted Hill definitely belongs in that lineup oh awesome. it absolutely does I like whenever I go to, like it's been a while since I did it but look I used to do uh like a Halloween night at friends houses and we would just binge watch a bunch of different horror films and we'd each bring a couple movies to the table and this is one that I'd always bring with me yeah man if you I, I'm not sure how uh, familiar you are with William Castle outside of this film but if you haven't seen a lot of his other stuff just uh, look him up and look up his uh, profile and start busting those out because they they're really good yeah I'll say because I'm I grew up with 13 ghosts the original mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I, my stepdad was a huge fan of William Castle so that's kind of how I got into these movies and if I remember correctly the tingler is also William Castle isn't it I believe so yeah yeah because I know he always loved to do those like a uh, hokey theater theatrical experiences with something going on in the theater like then with a tingler you got the vibrating seats to make it feel like you're getting electrified because the tingler's running loose in the theater and <laughs> things like that so like i know that's like william castle's thing and yeah i think those are like the three main ones that i've seen i know there's more that i've seen but i just can't remember them off the top of my head but yeah i've i grew up on a lot of william castle stuff yeah heck yeah that's um awesome. and how about you mike what is your number three all right my number three the movie starts with the letter h <laughs> but uh but to many people's surprise it ends with a number and that would be halloween three season of the witch. absolutely now now this is a movie i want to say i probably have done the biggest 180 on but you got to remember when i first saw it, it i feel like in the modern area era and when i say modern i'm gonna say the last 20 years I don't think this gets as much hate on the first watch as it mm -hmm. used to because no, no. I think people are much more prepared and they have the context going in. Well, me personally, the first time I saw it, I was a kid growing up in the midst of like, I'm just going to rent every horror movie I can on the VHS rack at the video store, right? Yep. So I get to Halloween 3 and even though it's subtitled season of the witch that doesn't mean much to a you know a 10 year old like i, I didn't right. look into it further there was no internet movie database or youtube reviews i could look up so i'm watching it and like half hour 45 minutes in i'm like what is this and then i i just didn't like it because of that reason rewatch it a few years later when i understand what's going on and 
I was like, wow, I was dumb. This is actually pretty good and entertaining and fun in its own right. Then you learn about Carpenter's original, you know, intention with the annual Halloween movie that's totally different from each other. Then you start putting it together and you're like, wow, okay, maybe they should have stuck to that given the Halloween franchise, which I'll <laughs> stay mum about now. But um, yeah, I just, I, I love it. Uh, I love the whole idea with the mask. Like how, if, if you're going to take out uh, kids worldwide, <laughs> What's uh, the easiest way to do it? Do it on a holiday with with masks that they're all going to put on. And man, what a what a gut punch of an ending, right? Where he's yeah. he's going to do it. He's going to save the day. Oh, yeah. turn, it off, turn 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 it off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that silver shamrock theme, you know, it, it oh, yeah. probably gets stuck in the head unintentionally every year. Well, I was going to say, that's what makes that truly a like Halloween movie to watch, just because it's like, it's got the, even the song, eight more days till Halloween, yeah. Halloween, Halloween. And, and um, really, if you isolate the score out, like if you just go listen to the, uh, the score in its entirety on YouTube or somewhere, the score is really good. Like the synthesized oh, yeah. music, it's just... It's eerie, it's jarring, but it's so fun to listen to. And obviously it's it's almost iconic in its own right, right? It, it's hard to say it's iconic when you're talking, because obviously the original Carpenter score of the original, but outside of that, I, I just think it, it's it's jarring in all the right ways. Yeah, agreed. Because um, and the, I'm going to actually kind of tell a little story here, because uh, you were saying how, you know, people nowadays, like, know going into it what to expect. So mm -hmm. I think that's why a lot of people like it. And what to expect. There's no Michael Myers, everyone. Spoiler. Yes. <laughs> but Spoiler um, for Halloween 3. Uh, but for me, I caught it probably late 80s. And it was uh, kind of a similar story with Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, blah, 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 where my stepdad brought home the entire Halloween VHS collection at the time because uh, he worked as a video distributor. And he brought them home mainly for me because he knew I was uh, big into the horror films. And I never, when I was a kid, I never started with number one, number two, number three. I always went by what had the coolest looking cover. So for me, Halloween 3 was my first introduction to the Halloween franchise. So I loved this movie from the very first time watching it because I had no idea who the fuck Michael Myers was. I didn't care at the time. Like, this just was a unique movie to me. And then I went back and watched all the other ones and I'm going, okay, this one doesn't fit in this franchise at all. What's going on here? <laughs> but like, I was completely clueless to it at the time. And I think that helped me enjoy the movie from the very beginning. So I saw Halloween 3 when I was 17. Oh, nice. So I had already seen the other Halloweens and I'm like, oh, I must have missed this one. I put it in. I'm like, no, oh, there's no Michael Myers in this one. Is it part of the series? It must not be part of the series. I'll just watch it on its own accord and liked it. <laughs> so I never <laughs> had any of the um, anger mm -hmm. that was associated with it because I just automatically assumed it wasn't part of the series. I'm like, oh, they must have just named it Halloween, like, you know, similarly, but it's like a completely different plot line. Mm -hmm. And I never got, I never realized how angry people were until I started joining horror groups on Facebook. I had no idea that people had actually got like upset about this and this was a thing. Um, yeah, I think it's a great film. I honestly, it's probably better than the other films. If we look at, well, I guess a lot of people can argue Halloween one is the best, but if we look at Tom Atkins delivery of lines and oh. the concept of the plot line, it's actually pretty clever. Like it really, mm -hmm. you know, and not that, you know, any of our Halloween films need to make sense, but you could kind of be like, yeah, it could get kids buying these masks and like in bulk. And maybe if you were able to put a spell when you're producing these masks and use a specific kind of rock, like it's not a bad concept how they thought, how they thought it through. Like it really wasn't bad for that time era. And I, yeah. I agree, as long as catchy as shit, like what a smart I, marketing. It's like, yeah. you got, you got mask, uh, you got robots and wait, yeah. is that Stonehenge? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like it's, it's, you know what I mean? But it's, it's kind of like, and then we got Michael Myers who beats up Buster Rhymes, which is definitely my number one Halloween resurrection. Number one, number one Halloween film of the year. I, 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 truth, best, best Halloween film in the series. I, I mean, uh, off this podcast right now. <laughs> so one, one scene in Halloween three that I love every time, and it's kind of a more unassuming scene. It's uh, when Atkins is kind of out, he's kind of started kind of, to look around and spy on a factory to see what's going on. When he runs into the homeless guy 
that she's yes. giving this drunken rant on yes. Cochrane music. Like, uh, you think he'd hire some of us local boys? No, he, he brought in all, like, he just does such a great drunk, like, kind of angry, yeah. put out of work bum that's like, yeah. he's suffering the wrath, and then he gets uh, his uh, punishment, I guess, for speaking out. You know? But it moved the plot along. That was the best <laughs> thing about that shit. It moved the plot along. Yeah, yeah right. it's good. Expo- oh it's good exposition right? of how right? Cochrane came in and kind of like took over the town on a and kept run. his people there so he could control the manufacturing. No one would know what he was doing. Like it was, it was smart. Um, so I'm glad you brought it to the table. I just put right. a connection to uh, modern day with this. Cochrane is Jeff Bezos, and <laughs> Amazon is putting all the others out of work. So that's where the poor drunk guy is. So yeah, the I better, all connecting. Oh and, and and as, soon as, as, as soon as Amazon's able to, they'll be using robots too. Don't, right, exactly. Uh, don't put it and they'll make masks. <laughs> they probably already do. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Heather, what is your number three? Uh, so my number three is a movie that has Art the Clown in it, but it isn't Terrifier. Mm. It is All Hallows' Eve 2013. Nice. Um, I love All Hallows' Eve 2013. I think that movie is fucking awesome. I think the wraparound is great with them finding a random. It's hard to work now because I think most people would be like, VHS, I don't even have a fucking player to play this on, right? Like, I think it it does kind of date itself when you use things like VHS, but there is something creepy to be said about a VHS tape, hence, hence all the VHS movies that we've had. So, especially, unfortunately, the most recent one, but I'm not <laughs> talking about that. Uh, I, I love the first one with the subway and like, you just see the chains and the woman is chained and she's trying to get her out. And oh my God, it's just so fucking dark. Oh, it and really is. I just think that the ending wraparound where she literally goes to check the children and he's standing there with blood all over himself, where he, you know, you assume that he killed the kids. That scene always stands out to me. Like that's your nightmare as a babysitter. And how it moved from what is it that it's the breaking, is it the fourth wall, Scott? Yes. The fourth wall. Um, I just, I thought All Hallows Eve was brilliant. I think for a low budget indie film, this is horror done right. You keep areas blacked out when you need to. You rely a lot on sound effects and you save your money for the gore that is needed. And this movie did an exceptional job of it. Uh, what do you gentlemen think? I assume you've seen them, seen All Hallows Eve. Oh yeah. Um, I think this is a very fun anthology, uh, very underrated, honestly, because you don't hear, you know, well, you didn't really hear much about it until Terrifier came out. And then it like started picking up in popularity because I had like the first introduction in uh, Art the Clown, which I got to say the final Art the Clown segment in that movie is the so- The gas station? Yeah, that one yeah. is so gory and creepy. And you can definitely see like, ah, this is where Terrifier came to be right here. Mm -hmm. And like how mean spirited it is. And yeah, just every story I thought worked really well. Like, I think the only one that was lower on my list was I think the alien one in this. Yeah, because it's weird how it ties into art. You just have like a picture. Yeah. Right. But like. But it was still had some creepy moments to it. And like every story like was very creepy. And I did like wrap around in this because, yeah, that is a really creepy thing to just find some random unmarked VHS. Well, And how they're watching it and they keep watching it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, how about you, Mike? Yeah, the intro to Art the Clown for sure is amazing. And I think anthologies just go with the holiday itself, too, because usually when you're writing stories for an anthology, there's some type of like morality tale or lesson. And when you kind of have a holiday associated with kids going out and have, having fun, getting all sorts of candy um, and all the all the, you know, quote unquote mischief going on on Halloween, having um some type of i I guess quasi lessons in your horror uh are always good and that's what anthologies usually specialize in and yeah it's fun and you know it's always cool to look back on the origins of art the clown as far as like where he made his first appearance and i think that's totally cool when a character from an anthology um gets his own full length like movie and now a sequel uh, yeah, that's yeah. always cool to see that and he's become kind of an icon now mm-hmm. i would say he's a he's a very slow burning icon but yes. i do think among horror fans he's recognized he doesn't obviously have the level that a lot of you know i always use non-horror fans as a basis to how well known an icon is 
Right. If I have a friend that's never watched a horror movie, but she knows who a certain character is, that's a well-known icon. If she has no idea, it's not a well-known icon. But I think right. Art the Clown for this generation in this decade is an excellent slasher. And we won't get into the slasher debate right now, but I think that he, wow. you know, is a very simplistic application of scariness. And I, and I think, you know, revises the whole clown thing. I think it is great, but Pennywise has been around for a very long time. This was something that was new that was in the 2010s that has been great, you know, and continues to develop. So yeah, there's great. always, uh, there's always, that level where something transcends from being horror to just straight up pop culture yeah. icon, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Scotty, number two. Uh, all right. So my number two is a well, little less known film from 1974, and it is Young Frankenstein. What? No one's ever heard of this one. What are you talking about? I was about? shocked at your list, Scott. I did not see these coming <laughs> at all. Um. Well, Did the guy is... direct anything else? So that's what I want to know. Oh, Mel Brooks? No, I don't think anybody's heard of Mel Brooks at all. I mean, Who Spaceballs, what? <laughs> Though I am going to say it right here, because I know a lot of people do not like this movie, and I am a champion for it, and that is Dracula Dead and Loving It. Fucking love that movie. <laughs> I like that movie, too. It's fun. Uh, but yeah, I once again, this is another one that I grew up watching when I was a kid. My parents introduced it to me. And I had seen this before I even seen the original Frankenstein. So I, this was my introduction to Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. And the comedy in this is just so perfect to me. Like it's one of my all-time favorite, I guess you'd call it horror comedies. And uh, Gene Wilder, just like, he's one of my favorite comedians from back in the day. And like, I just love everything about this film. It's that got that Gothic feel of the original Frankenstein uh, has just some very corny lines and just some very quirky characters and like this movie works as a complete whole for me as and yeah I once again kind of like House on Haunted Hill it doesn't set it's not set around Halloween but around this time of year is when I have to sit down and watch it it is like my tradition for sure I've seen it I you feel like and it? I and I really like Mel Brooks films like a oh, lot you, you yeah. gotta see this movie so I gotta oh watch God. it I'll like it because I like all Mel Brooks movies I think they're all funny I Blazing Saddles like obviously humors has grown and developed from the time that that you know movie was yeah. made but there are you know I do think there is some value to taking a movie at its face value when it was made um so yes yeah, so I definitely need to check this out yeah especially because it's like it fits right in the horror genre so it's like it fits with the first time watches that we always do too so you would yeah I, I recommend you check this out because I would love to hear your thoughts on it and I think you would laugh your ass off <laughs> yeah as far as far as I go much like Scott I saw Young Frankenstein before I had seen Frankenstein and I already thought it was hilarious, but then after you see Frankenstein and go back and watch Young, it's like takes on a whole new level of funny because of how right. accurate they are in their in their satire, right? It's 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 uncanny how how good of a job. And whenever you see a horror comedy like that, where they just nail everything, it it gives you a better appreciation because you're like the the writer director must have had a love for the source material in the first place you know this isn't make you know it's not they're not doing this because they thought the original was no good it's because they love the original and they want to spread more joy and cheer based off the original and it is so good i mean that i love the scene um when uh gene wilder's like whatever you do do not open the door <laughs> and then when he, when he gets in there open it like it's so puts the candle good. back <laughs> gene wilder uh, i mean not just in this movie but man if this is your introduction to gene wilder anybody uh it's it's all as good as he is in everything he's in it it sets the bar so high just oh it does like yeah. his performance in this is incredible and it, it's probably my favorite film of his and i love a lot of his and richard Pryor stuff that he did they did together too and but yeah this is top tier gene wilder for me i fucking love this movie mm -hmm. awesome. and any, anytime a horror comedy can stand on its own uh you know you have something excellent absolutely yeah, exactly uh mike what is your number two all right, so just a little bit ago, I was talking about anthologies and how I think they fit perfect with the holiday. So why not an anthology that takes place on the holiday of Halloween? This one has a similar title to something on Scott's <laughs> list. 
but uh, let's take the O out of the the or and make it trick or treat. <laughs> yeah. Or trick or treat, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, I just love the, the funny story. Going back, this one was um, shelved by the studio. I yeah. don't. I have no idea why. Like, I remember they're assholes. They're just idiots. I mean. I remember seeing a trailer for it and then like two years went by and I was like, where the hell is this movie? And they just eventually released it on Blu-ray, like out of nowhere. So I, I go get it, throw it on. And I'm like, how the hell did they not think this would make money in the theaters? Like may, maybe because Anna Paquin wasn't like huge star at the time and they thought she wasn't up to care, but I'm like, just release it like the week of Halloween people will go see this and it's all it's pretty much beloved across the board now and justifiably so and it's just a, you know a small example of the theaters or studio heads not understanding what they have on their hands and uh i, I think you know i i don't want to say as a matter of fact that this was the first movie to do it but i think it, it it was part of the modern trend with uh wraparound stories really being incorporated in the main movie i thought it was a very uh, brilliant and at the time a new feeling thing to do and uh i just love all the stories in this i love how they all meld together it's creepy it's scary at parts and the stories are fun and, and i you know i think it's almost a perfect movie yep i completely agree like this uh michael darty just needs to continue working on uh holiday themed horror films because he seems to just nail the aspect of what the holidays are about because trick-or-treat it's literally as you're watching it going this is literally the season halloween on film it's like everything about it just feels like halloween and how cool is the town like i want to be yeah. in that town on halloween <laughs> right like throwing huge ass halloween parties out in the middle of the streets and just like everybody seems to be into the spirit of it and mm -hmm. you know we were talking about uh terror art the clown being like a icon for the horror masses um, Sam is one of those where I would say it's in between the people that don't watch horror and the horror fans with being a horror icon. He's like surpassed art and he's on his way to being well known across the world because he's only had one movie, but yet you see images of him everywhere. And in Halloween stores, there's costumes of him now. And like he's he's become he's becoming one of the good icons that people that don't watch horror films will know. Ah, uh, not yet. Not now, yet. Say, that's what I'm saying. He's on his not way. Yet. Yeah. He's yeah, on he's... his way though. I will agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I, a little louder for the people in the back, both of you gentlemen nailed it. Excellent anthology. I think it's a perfect Halloween movie. Um, I think all the shorts are great. I think the acting is fucking high quality in every single one, but you're looking at some pretty decent names you have in these, in this, yeah. um, in this movie, you know, you get mm -hmm. decent actors, you get a good, production but budget you get good directing good writing entertaining doesn't overstay its welcome give me a sequel is how i feel so mm -hmm. thanks for bringing it to the table mike it's awesome cool love yeah. this movie i i assumed you guys liked it too but you never know <laughs> hey, right no what is there not to like we're we have good taste mike well somewhat, <laughs> hey, somewhat. you Oh, I, two of you have good taste. Heather keeps telling me I don't, but. <laughs> no, your taste has surprised me today. Gremlins hasn't come up once, so that's been oh, great. Oh, there's still a number one to come. Oh, for fuck my life. <laughs> so my number two, um, I'm sticking with the 2010s, uh, is the houses that October, the houses October built. Oh, nice. Um, I thought this was a phenomenal found footage film. Uh, Scotty and I watched this. I think we covered it last Halloween. We talked. Yeah, we about did it for our, well, not for our Halloween, but we did it for our haunt, a haunted attractions episode. Yes, yes. Um, I fucking love this movie. I love the concept that they're going around to these different haunts. Now, I think there was like a documentary they were making at the same time. And then this movie kind of, they did this too. Is that how it worked? Or is that just I, a rumor I heard? I think there was like a mix of the two going on together. Right? I could be wrong on that. So I love how they piss off those random people because I have been in haunts. I've, I've gone to a lot of them. And there's always those people that take it a little too seriously. Right. Um, I was telling Scotty that, I went to this thing called Haunted Manor. This was a couple of years ago. And I had one of the characters get right in my face and tell me she was going to slit my throat, uh, which is fine. It's a haunt. Uh, but I was like, 
that's a probably a little much for 2019 to be doing that. Um, there was another dude who was Jason who came charging towards me. And of course I was just like, Jason, Jason, Jason. <laughs> and then like, we took a selfie together and I told him how much I loved his costume. And he was like, I know this is like the best ever. So I, I think you get a mix of people, which is what I liked that October, the houses that October built talked about. It showed yes. people that do take it too far. And it went into the area of extreme haunts. Now, the second one isn't as good, but I do really appreciate what the first one was trying to do, the interviews they did, talking to people. And I don't believe there's criminal reference checks. Um, when I watched Haunters, the haunt, Haunters, Art of the Scare. Oh, yeah. yeah there's not, <laughs> right, in some of these haunts. So I thought that that was really interesting. So have you seen this movie, Mike? I'm sorry, Mike. Mike went on yep. mute. I was I was taking a drink of water and I was like, oh, she's coming to me first. Uh, yes, I have seen it, and I, I think uh, movies about haunts, haunted houses, haunted attractions, haunted anything, perfect for the holiday. And I, I totally agree that, like, in I would say in what the last decade, maybe 15, 20 years, even there's kind of become this fine line between haunted attractions and hey, pay us to torture you, <laughs> like yeah. for the and. Yeah. There's everything in between where, you know, depending on your experience, your talents. Me personally, I don't get the let's pay to torture you. Like, I don't want to be tortured and I don't want to no. pay you to do it. But I love haunted attractions. Like, I love that yeah. end of it. Um, and, you know, as far as people jumping out and scaring you, oh, that's perfect. I just I don't want to be tied up and put in a coffin. And uh, yeah, no, that that'll happen eventually anyway. Right? <laughs> One and day. hopefully we won't be able for it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Right. Um but uh, yeah, I've always loved uh, movies and the idea of like, oh, we're seeking out like the ultimate haunt. Uh, we're the people that have seen everything. You can't get us. Yeah. Well, I think this movie's going to get you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Another perfect uh, movie with a theme for Halloween. Awesome. And Scott, you've yeah. seen it. I, I think you oh, yeah. did it. Yeah. Right. You told yeah, me. I, that. I really dig this freaking movie. It's super creepy, and it it's literally people like us that are the characters. Yeah. Which just fits. And you know, like, it should be our horror podcasting community. Yeah, right. It would be fitting. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really dig the hell out of this movie. And I, I didn't even think about this one, like, for the list. I was like, oh, well, as soon as you mentioned it, it was like, damn, that would have been a good one. Now, hey, we got a variety going on, but now we've made it to numero uno. So, Scotty. All right. So I have a feeling I may be stealing at least possibly someone's uh, number one here because it has not been mentioned yet. But. I'm going to go basic bitch here, but if you're going to go for the Halloween season, there's only one film that truly is the king of Halloween. Hubie's Halloween. Yes. <laughs> and that would be, of course, John Carpenter's classic 1978 Halloween. Like, I fucking love this movie. This is a literally Halloween night tradition for me every year. Just it's the score, the atmosphere to it, uh, just the low budget style of this film like do it yourself like filmmaking guerrilla style like john carpenter and his crew have done and to come out with such a tense horror film that just i don't know how to say it but it's like one of the first slasher films like that i've seen that was bloodless but yet also one of the more terrifying ones mm -hmm. at the time when i first seen it like just the use of lighting and shadow in this movie really make this stand out and make I, I can see why Michael Myers is who he is and why we still have a billion movies and one that just came out. But whoa, nothing... whoa. a Halloween movie came out? Yeah. It was why called, is someone uh, talking about it? It's called Halloween, Hubie's Cousin. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, cool. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just love this movie. And I know like this is like probably everyone's like go to Halloween movie, but I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't not add it to the list. Mike, have you heard this film before? <laughs> you know, it's been on my watch list for a while. <laughs> and I think this may finally be the year I get around to it, if I'm lucky. You totally you should. I think I hear there's like some it. sequels too. You might want. Oh, yeah, you might want to yeah. watch those too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure about those. It really depends how good the original is. If if that's decent, maybe I'll dive into a sequel or two. Yeah, right, right. No, but seriously, seriously, yeah, iconic score, probably the most recognizable score across, you know, not just horror, but all cinema, period. I got the privilege to see John Carpenter do it live yep, at same. his concert a handful of years back. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very serious horror movie. Like for a slasher, it's 
it's almost minimal minimalist in its approach but that's why it works so well yes. because it's the scenario set up is very real i love i it, something that i think is important that starts to get lost with the sequels is there's a very fine uh rope they walk between is he supernatural or is he just doing ex- like is he extraordinary or is he just doing extraordinary things and i think that's that's all with with what the original set up that's a line you have to walk and i think as the franchise goes on they veer a little too much in one direction mm-hmm. for it to and that's that's why it's never been replicated as well as the original and when it veers off it's why I have a problem with it later on where other people don't, which is fine. Everyone has their own opinion on it. But for me personally, I think there, it was just the entire aura around Michael Myers was designed so perfect where actually I've always made the argument that it's Dr. Loomis that gives him his mystique in the original. When you, any scene where you hear Loomis talk about Michael, that's what puts in your head. Well, what the hell are we dealing with here? It's, it's not right. always just Michael's actions himself. It's Dr. Loomis describing the horror of what he's witnessed over the years of trying to reach him. Right. Um, his exposition is just like some of my favorite in all of cinema, but uh, yeah, I mean, we can go on forever about the original. It's, it's legendary. Great. Love it. How could you not pick it for one? Right. Yeah. Right. I, it, it's number one for a reason. Well, and I think if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, please check out the Netflix series Movies That Made Us. Yes. Um, it, they cover Halloween is one of the first ones. And I think that if you're not a huge Halloween fan, like I like how, don't get me wrong, I enjoy the movie quite a bit. I think it's phenomenal. I definitely have more respect for it now after watching it and realizing what they had to work with, especially that opening scene that they filmed last. You want to watch something fucking fascinating? Watch that segment. Yeah. Uh, finding out that Donald Pleasant was absolutely hammered for half of that movie. <laughs> like, really hammered. Also very entertaining. Um, you know, I, I think it has its place in cinema history, and I think Netflix acknowledged that. So, Mike, what's mm-hmm. your number one? Well, like I said, how could you not pick Halloween for number one, right? Which is exactly why I didn't. Um, (laughs) um, We'll get to that once we get to honorable mentions. But um, I picked one relatively recent, although I can't believe it's already been eight years because I had to look up on IMDb because I I know it's somewhat recent, but where are we in this? But yeah, it's been eight years. So I feel like this as a number one pick or even being on the list at all might be polarizing because I think this is a movie that works better for people that have a personal connection to what this film kind of depicts and what it represents. It's a very small indie film, but for someone who me, like me, who grew up, you know, uh, mid eighties to mid nineties was kind of my kid to teenage years. This is what it felt like when you turned on the TV on Halloween. This is what was on the local networks in the on the evening news when they were like, oh, let's go do uh, let's go out in the neighborhood and let's look up something spooky in the most cheesiest way possible. This is such an accurate depiction of that that I I feel bad and not condescending wise, but I just feel bad for people who didn't get that experience growing up because I don't know if local news networks still do this type of thing. Yeah. But man, WNUS special. It yes. I have to throw it on every year, <laughs> you know. It's when I first threw it on, it just totally took me back. And I was like, the people who made this obviously grew up like that too, because it's so accurate. I I almost like to play a game every where I throw it on for people that don't know it's a movie and see how long it takes for them to realize, no, this isn't just an old VHS tape I found in like a box somewhere. This is an actual movie based on what we all saw when we were growing up. And I, I just think uh, the way it, 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 for a point you don't know, like is something really going to seriously happen to the character or is it just all put on like the local news networks right. were in their specials. And as it just goes on and on, I just get more impressed with it. And it's a total fun time. And man, that is the news in my childhood, exactly what it was like. I, I love it. And it's become an annual watch for me. So WNUF special, my number one. I just watched that as a first time watch this year. Just recently, actually. Nice. Yeah, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as you did, but I think it's I think it's um, beyond creative. Mm-hmm. I think that movie like took every other Halloween film and said, fuck this shit, we're going to do our own thing. And I really respect that movie because of it. I think you're right. It captured the 90s perfectly. 
And I think the acting in it is really good. Like, I think it's a lower budget film too. Like, I don't think it had a high budget that it was working with and it was, mm. it used its budget well and it's entertaining. I'm glad I finally saw it. Like, I feel like I was in a miss for not seeing it. Yep. And for me, I actually watched this for the first time last year around this oh, time of year. Nice. Yeah. So um, that's why it did not make my list because I've only watched it once, but I, this is one that would be in rotation. I can totally see that because it's uh, like everything you guys said, it, literally captures what the news was like back then in the 90s around that time of year just to get the ratings by going to some like abandoned house or to some haunted place and it's kind of funny because I actually watched uh because I've been on a Tales from the Crypt uh binge lately and there was Mm -hmm. an episode very similar to what happens in WNUF with a newscaster that's going to a haunted house for a Halloween thing just to get the ratings and then something happens Mm -hmm. And yeah, this movie is just fun. It definitely has that 90s feel, like the late 80s, 90s, early 90s feel. And like, I was just enamored with it when I watched it. Like, I probably should not have been watching it at work because I didn't end up (laughs) getting much work done because I was just too glued to my screen watching it. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, this is this is one that I will definitely be having in my constant October rotation now for sure. Great pick, Ooh. Mike. Thanks for bringing it to the table. All uh, right, Heather, number one for you. You know what it is, Scott, guaranteed because I haven't said it yet. And Scott knows this is one of my all-time favorite movies. It is Haunt from 2019. Yes. I love this film. I will never stop loving this film. As you can tell, I love haunts. No. This film is like every fucking worst nightmare. And if you've gone to these butt fuck nowhere, like haunted houses, it's not far off from what it looks like when you drive up to it. And they go through, they got that room where you go to feel what's in the bucket. They see that chick get killed and they think it's just part of the show and it's not. And one of my favorite scenes is when they get outside and it's the dude with the one guy and he goes, would you like to see what my face looks like? Oh, that's so crazy. And that scene alone, I was like, fuck yeah, movie. Fuck yeah. Uh, The scene where she's trying to get away from the final killer or one of the killers at the end in that bedroom. Like, it is just overall, love it, love it, love it. Thank God this movie was made. It's on Shudder. I can't praise it enough. Haunt is my number one. That is such a fun film. So freaking fun. Mike, are you a fan? Yeah, and it kind of came out of nowhere too. Like, um, yeah. I don't think it had like a huge amount of fanfare like leading up to its release. It just kind of got released at the right time. And I mean, with the name like Haunt, you're going to assume it's related to Haunt stuff. And yes, it was. And then you think the movie's over and then we get that final scene at the house. And it's like, oh, the final showdown, right? But it's, yeah, yeah I'm, glad, cool. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I remember we did this on Fresh Cuts and I think Moods was a guest on that one. And it yep. almost turned into like a half haunt, half candy corn episode because we had seen that movie Candy Corn at the same time. But yeah, man, it's a fun one. Awesome, yeah. awesome. I'll get it my I'll get my shout outs now just because we're on me. Yep. Uh so my shout outs, a lot of them were already mentioned, but I do love Halloween four five. I do love that storyline of Jamie Lee Curtis having or Lori having a daughter, Jamie, and Jamie, especially four. Five gets a little silly, but I always did dig four quite a bit. Um, There was a lower budget one that came out in 2007 called House of Fear, which I feel like it's, you know, another haunt one where a group of teenagers go to a haunt and they go through and they end up being killed off as they go through and they're just trying to survive to get out. It's also really cool and uh, really, I found it entertaining. The Scare House 2014 about young ladies getting revenge against each other using a haunted house as a cover. And finally, one of my all-time favorite films is Sleepy Hollow from 1999. Nice. That that is a good list. Uh, What was the House of Fear? I don't think I've seen. No, a lot of people haven't seen. I think it's on Prime, so you could probably check it out there. Okay, I'll have to watch that because, yeah, I'm trying to look for Halloween films I have not seen yet. Like Because I've seen a lot, especially for after last year when I was doing a lot of the first-time watches. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll do my uh, honorable mentions. Uh, like Heather said, a bunch had been mentioned already, but uh, Night of the Demons, obviously, because I just fucking love that movie. Um, Trick or Treat 2007, because yeah, I, I fucking love this movie as well, but I knew at least one of us for sure would have that one on our list. <laughs> Halloween almost made it to this honorable mention list because I had assumed someone would put it on the list, but I'm glad I brought it for the main list because no one did talk about it. Um, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Fuck yes. Uh, Adam's Family, 1991. Fun film. 
I watch once again, it's not necessarily a Halloween themed movie, but it just fits this time of year. And I remember going to theaters and seeing it and absolutely loving it. Uh, and then this one I watched last year and I, for the first time, and I ended up watching the entire trilogy, but uh, Hell House LLC. Just yeah, great trilogy. Oh. Great trilogy. Oh my God, I love that freaking movie yeah. so much. It is so damn creepy. And I've already watched it three times since last year. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, Scotty. Uh, and then, of course, Hocus Pocus from 1993, because it's another one I wouldn't seen in theaters when I was a kid. And to this day, still holds up. It has some, once again, creepy moments to it and awesome uh, zombie effects with Billy, played by a good old Doug Jones. <laughs> Nice, nice. Uh, and how about you, uh, Mike? What are your honorable mentions? All right, so I um, I have a few. First one, I'll well, the first two are pretty obvious. Uh, Halloween, the original. Hell yeah. Uh, the only reason it wasn't on my list was because when I was putting together my list, I know I remember asking Heather beforehand, like, are we omitting the Halloween franchise because it's just they're obvious picks? She said no. So my initial thought was like, well, it's going to be on there somehow. But the, the only reason I didn't was because Halloween, the original, it's just kind of by default, always on anyway in the month of October. Like, right. I don't really have to make an effort to be like, OK, I'm going to sit down and watch Halloween because it's Halloween. Like, I've already it's already been on my TV about four times this month because I work from home and AMC is doing sense. like their fear fest. So it's like always on in the background in this month, no matter what, even if I'm not giving it 100 percent of my attention so next one i'm actually a big fan of the sequel halloween 2 uh yeah, i love here. the That's fact that it, yeah i love the fact that it takes place immediately the same night right after the events of the first one i know it has the controversial like brother sister uh element added to it i've never had a problem with it i understand why people are annoyed by it because it's, it's not really necessary but I think it makes sense in certain ways, which, you know, we can get into that another time when we break down the movie, but I'll just say I, I really like it. And my last one is, uh, I don't know if this is a controversial pick or not, but House of a Thousand Corpses, because a lot of people forget that Fuck it actually yeah. takes place on Halloween night. Like, Fuck yeah, I, Mike. I, uh, I trimmed oh, that yeah. one off my list. Like it was in my honorable mentions. I was like, all right, I have too many honorable mentions. I'll trim House of a Thousand Corpses off, but that's another one I watch around October every year. Yeah, and I know, I would say the majority of people like Devil's Rejects better, and I understand why, and I'm not even going to argue that House of a Thousand Corpses is better, even though I personally kind of like it better, but... To me, it's like you take the characters from Devil Rejects. Well, what are these crazy serial killers? What would they do on Halloween? Well, that's yes. House of a Thousand Corpses. And the fact that we actually get Halloween happening in it, I think that's an element that's overlooked because people don't really throw this one in on Halloween movies list, but it is taking place on Halloween. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a big Halloween like aesthetic lit. going out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. I love yeah, the movies we brought to the table here. Can I just say that it was a variety of decades yes. too. Like we went all the way back to 1959 as recent as 2019 and everything in between. Like, I think we gave people a variety of whatever your preference may be. And really like, honestly, there's a bunch of Halloween I didn't, movies I didn't mention that we all love. I'm sure you guys are the same. Like, it's hard yeah. to find a Halloween movie you don't like, to be quite honest with you. Um, I don't know. Maybe I won't like Halloween Kills. Seeing that soon. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but... I yeah this has been a lot of fun so thank you so much Mike for joining oh man that was it was fun and the funny thing is with lists I'm always like like uh apprehensive because lists are so subjective even to yourself right like my list today you could be like come back in a month to do the same list over again and I might have three of the five different but yep, same yeah it's still fun I, I almost see lists as like a time capsule like at this time this is what my top whatever were and if it changes in a year so be it and Absolutely, that's, and that's kind of why we love doing these like list shows for Patreon because it's we know everybody loves lists like it's just mm -hmm. something fun and it you uh, end up finding something that or you bring up some movies that people may not have seen before and you help maybe even some of the hosts haven't seen before so it's just kind of neat to hear other people's opinions on what their favorites are and whatever topic we end up choosing for these top five and I'm very happy that you got to join us for this because, yeah, this has uh, definitely been very fun and very surprising with like how I think we didn't have really any repeats for the most part until our honorable mentions. Yeah, and even then, like, of course, everyone's going to say Halloween 1978, right? But yeah. like, I think we brought enough other varieties. But Mike, speaking of opinions, where can people hear more of your opinion? <laughs> Plug your stuff. 
Yeah. If you aren't tired of my opinions yet, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the probably easiest way to find me is on Fresh Cuts. That's a weekly show where we cover new stuff, whether theatrical or VOD. Obviously, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the next big one that's coming out is uh, Halloween Kills. We'll be covering that this coming up month. Well, I guess depending on when this episode releases, it'll be This will probably Monday. go to Patreon next week. So okay. it will, your Fresh Cuts will be out before this is released. For exactly. Sure. Yeah. For sure. So yeah, if you want to hear me and my co-host talk about Halloween Kills, check that out on Dark Discussions. And then the main show is No More Room in Hell, as Heather said, where uh, that one is mainly, or mostly we just pick movies we feel like watching. We rotate who does the picks and then all kind of like your news, any, any topics in the horror genre people want to talk about. And then we just kind of get catch up on what we're watching because even with fresh cuts we we still have plenty of new movies we don't get to talk about on there so we'll throw the ones we don't cover on fresh cuts on there but those are the main things and uh yeah that's it burning for springwood i think scott already brought up we talked freddy's nightmares you got to be really uh patient to want to hear people talk about <laughs> freddy's nightmares i won't lie but if that's your jam check it out Awesome. Well, thank you so much for plugging your stuff and joining us as always. Uh, Scott, sorry, you were going to say something? I was going to say, yeah, Burning for Springwood's a lot of fun, like, because we were, we were lucky enough to join them for one of the episodes, and that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. going back and visiting some of those Freddy Nightmares episodes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was a good time. And you know that you can find Mike, I think, is, there, is that still on Legion, or no, is it uh, no longer on Legion? Uh, Burning for Springwood is Legion, I believe, because technically Gary is the i i don't even know what but I, I he's a brainchild of burning for springwood and i believe all of gary's stuff is legion yes it is so you can find mike on legion he's also been i believe some panels on legion as well too and if you are listening to this early and you're a legion patreon thank you so much for your support thank you if you are listening to this on the weekend of halloween you could have been listening to this earlier if you were a legion member <laughs> if you pay three dollars a month you get access to not only scott and i sharing our top five and a much better podcaster joining us on each episode but you also get cinema psyops, cinema psyops special episodes you get bows ramsels dark parade episodes you get lots of good stuff so please join us if you haven't already what are you waiting for join um, us, join us. Yeah. and on one that of us. One <laughs> of us. and on that note scotty anything you need to add before we say goodbye um, just that I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe Halloween and enjoys the spooky season as it continues on. And until next time, kitties, unpleasant dreams. Bye. Have a pumpkin spice latte. <laughs>